This channel is part of the History Hit Network. While they were building this extension to their house here in Pat Castle in Cumbria, the Buckingham family discovered this piece of Roman pottery. Can you see that little bird on the tree there? But that was just the start of their discoveries. They came up with these two quern stones, hold boxes of finds, and they've even got what appears to be the outline of a Roman building right here. Being fans of Time Team, they contacted us because they want to find out what on earth the Romans could have been doing here in their back garden nearly 2,000 years ago. And as usual, we've got just three days to find out. So which of the stones that you reckon are part of the Roman building? Well, we've got a line of stones through here. This one here? Yep. Yeah, and this and one? And then a line of stones through here. There's the one under the retaining wall and there's a couple under these puddles. So this one here? Yep. Through to there? That's it. Why do you think that they're Roman? We found all the pottery in this area, so, I mean, I'm assuming they are Roman because of the pottery. If it is, then presumably the whole building goes over your fence and into next door? I think so. So can we excavate there? No, unfortunately I've spoken to the neighbour and he's not too happy about you disturbing his garden. So we're going to have to concentrate on here? Yeah, I think so. Mick, what are we going to do? Well, we've got to get rid of all that soil and, and water off the top so we can see what we're dealing with. We want to be able to define different areas so that we know which bits we want to dig. But we will put a trench in. Oh, yeah. you bet. Great. Well, <laughs> well, well let's what get are started. we waiting for? <laughs> And don't worry, whatever happens, we won't undermine your house. Oh, well, I promise. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> believe that, believe anything. You think you would, right? It's been six months since Ray Down Tools and contacted us, so it could take a couple of hours to clean off the trampled soil. Yeah, come on. And what we want to do is start at that end and literally we just work our way back, just peel the whole thing back. As you can see, Ray's done a great job of making an accurate record of what he's found. Apart from scraping away the topsoil and discovering the actual Roman foundation stones, he hasn't dug inside the building shape at all. Most of his Roman finds so far have come from digging the foundation trenches for the extension. Look at this. This is one of those dream finds, Mick. Tell him where you found it. I found it under the stones when we were under digging the, the foundations. We lifted the big cornerstone up of the building and yeah, this was underneath. That's what we pray for, that mm. is a coin under a stone. Yeah. Because? Well, because whatever date this is, and depending on how worn it is, it had to, the stone has to be later than that date. Can you tell anything from that? Well, I was thinking of sort of, you know, bouncing light across it and, and perhaps getting something out of that, but it needs cleaning up. It's smashed at the edge anyway. Well, right, unfortunately, I did that when I was uh, excavating under the stone. Just oh, clipped it with a pickaxe. Pickaxe, yeah. <laughs> now, which stone was it under then? We found it under that stone there. So it's under the corner of the... Yep. Yeah, it was about two inches below the bottom of the stone, so I just wonder if someone actually laid it there before yeah. they actually put that stone on. Ray's drawing shows the position of more large stones, which could be a corner of a second Roman building going off in this direction under his lawn. Geophysics have been set the challenge of trying to find further evidence of it, hence this new and rather strange looking piece of kit. Well, it looks like one of those wooden towel rails I got in my bathroom. Yeah, it cuts the grass as well, don't you see? Yeah. <laughs> It may look like a towel rail, but this is state-of-the-art radar equipment specially brought in from Sweden, and it's our only hope of detecting more foundation stones deep down under two metres of garden soil. You've got this phenomenal amount of stuff here, Helen. I'm, I'm amazed. You've, you've obviously found a lot. It's all been washed. You've looked after it. It's been sorted. It's mind-boggling. Well, we actually um, started off by finding a few pieces of samian ware, and then it just... You recognised it? You, you well, knew it was old? we'd been to the Jorvik Museum in York the weekend before and Ray had said, well, if we find any of that stuff, that's Roman. 
And, and you did. The following weekend, we <laughs> dug our first hole and we pulled out this piece of pot. Well, Guy, your Samian's your thing, isn't it? I mean, Samian's what we all think of as the smart end of the Roman pottery market, but is it really high status? It is high status to the extent that it was what the better people used, but the real people with money had silverware, so don't get the impression it was the best you could get. It was second best in that sense. It was your everyday table pottery. It was everyday... Ex- your middle class. It was everyday expensive table pottery, yes. But we've got a whole range of stuff here. What sort of date range do you think we're covering here? This one is one I would pick out straight away as probably being late first century. That's, that's about 50 years after the Romans invaded Britain, and maybe a little bit either side. But we're running right on with other pieces... Um, to the best part of a hundred years later. So the Samian ware that we can see laid out on this table covers something like 80 to 100 years from around the year 90. So are there any things that are particularly interesting the way the small finds, Lindsay? Yeah, so the small finds, there are several pieces. Um, This is a piece of a pipe clay statuette. Um, It's one half of what's called a Dea Nutrix figurine. That's a nursing mother goddess. And that's the back of her basket chair. And these were made in Gaul, pretty well in the same sort of area as the Samian ware. So that's a rather nice little religious object, which would be in somebody's house or something like that. The Buckinghams seem to have lots of second century Roman finds. Some of them are really nice, like this bronze lid featuring a tiny duck. We've we've sat and looked at that and looked at it and thought, what could it be? (laughs) Of course, you can can see it now. Yeah, you you can can see the duck. This is similar to a Roman jug lid Lindsay has seen before, and we can show Helen how this might have looked. Also, the religious statuette, the goddess of nursing mothers, which would have sat in a shrine in a Roman home. All we can say about the finds discovered in this garden so far is that they all appear to be domestic. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that there's so much Roman archaeology here in the Buckingham's garden, because their house is just 100 metres away from a known Roman fort. What it looks like is if you've got the fort up on the hill, uh, the river down here, and then you've got civilian settlement, called they're called vicus, mm-hmm. um, between the fort and the river. On the basis the south. that a, a fort full of soldiers need lots of services and goods to supply them. Yes, you get camp followers and, and you get people making bits and pieces for them. Can we also see how this fits into the general area around, because that should help yeah, well, us Well, Sue's got a map of all the Roman forts and the road system around here. Oh, yes, look at that. There, right. Well, you can see that, that's this, where we are here. Yeah. Now, that suggests to me, Guy, that this place is quite important in the middle of a whole series of other sites. And is that how you read it? That's right. There's an awful lot of forts over really quite a small area. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that we're just to the southwest of the end of Hadrian's Wall, which was built in the early 2nd century. So Just we're, north of Carlisle. Then. That's right. So we're just behind in that protected zone inside the northern part of Roman Britain, but it's still very, very much a military area. Yeah. And the reason the army's up here is not only a question of controlling the local people, but it's also a question of controlling people coming in and raiding from Ireland, perhaps, other people raiding down the west coast of Scotland, but then also from the Roman point of view, the wonderful part about this, uh, the wonderful point about this part of the world was the enormous number of natural resources, and we know that lead was mined in northern Britain. Well, I was going to ask you that because to have that number of forts, even if they're not all occupied at the same time, suggests that they're trying to hold down quite a big local population at some stage. That's absolutely right. And of course, these forts, in fact, in the long term, will have become completely integrated with the local population. Mm, yeah. Soldiers didn't bring their own wives with them. They generally intermarried with the local people. And eventually, perhaps the original purpose behind the mm. fort had really been abandoned. They just became living communities as well. Wait, Tom. Oh, well, we got some pottery here, uh, uh, Tony. Is that Roman? That's Roman Samian. And how long had you been cleaning before you started finding the finds? Oh, almost immediately. So the, the first finds were starting to come up. That bodes well. And I it? mean, yeah, literally, you can see, we're getting finds from just cleaning it back. Brilliant. So uh, we're just scratching the surface. Ray has reused some of the Roman stones he found in the garden. There's a lot of archaeology in there, isn't there? It's possibly. I mean, one of the nice features we've been able to do is use the stones that we found in this area. Yeah. They were sort of trapezoidal shape. I wondered if they were arch stones, but we've been able to sort of reuse them again in these yeah, nice that, stone. That, they do sound like bourgeois. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> trapezoidal and bourgeois in one <laughs> sentence. What are we talking about? Well, the fact that they are wider here and narrower here, you know, 
I mean, it, it, that's what you need if you're going to put an arch in. Yeah, well, one that we've not used, I mean, you can see that you've got a, a, a square face, and then all faces seem to go back to a slightly smaller yeah. square face. Yeah, I mean, if you imagine that in the top of an arch, and then a series of them round like that, then you've got the top of a, a doorway or a window, we were thinking. Yeah. So possibly, the Roman buildings in this garden had arched windows and looked something like this. It's certainly a starting point, and something to show the Buckingham children who have now arrived home from school. And look at the things we've been finding. Of course, they're eager to see what Phil's dug up. A nice bit of Roman pot. Do you think that goes that way up? No, that way. Yeah. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Possibly because some of it is stuff they buried themselves. <laughs> Do you think that that's Roman? Yours? <laughs> it was yours. Yeah. They can also see one of the pottery finds reconstructed. Imagine what the rest of this pot would have looked like. Look, can you see? Do you think that looks a bit like that? Yeah. Then I've taken yeah. the texture in. I've actually put this under my camera and I've grabbed it in. And I've applied it to that shape I've just made. There. What do you reckon? So it's a big fish, used for grinding stuff up in. Print it, print it. Print it. However, we have different plans for this piece of pottery, the first bit the Buckinghams found, because we're going to try and go one better than reconstructing it on the computer. We're going to attempt to make a figured Samian ware bowl in just three days. I think this is a bit of a long shot, because it's made in several stages. It's a bit like making a jelly. You make the mould, then you push the clay into it. To so we've got get to make the, the mould first. Right, well, Gilbert's doing that. He's making the mould, yeah. the, the jelly mould. But of course, on the wheel, you'll just get the smooth interior with no sort of features at all. So you just get a completely round jelly. So we've got to make stamps to press into that interior. And what Victor's doing is making the mould for the stamps. Once we've made these, we can then press clay into them to get the shape standing out like that. And then what we'll do when this clay is hard is push into the side of the bowl so we get the decorated pattern all round. Then we'll have to fire that mould. Then it's much harder than the clay. The soft, fresh clay gets pushed in, rounded up on the wheel, and then put in the kiln fired to go on the table. Our main problem is going to be getting the stamps dry enough that they will impress into the clay in time. Back in the Buckingham's garden, the results from our new Swedish radar machine are ready to look at. But first, John's keen to explain how it works. So what we've got here is radar pack. It sends waves, electromagnetic radiation, into the ground. You've got a transmitter here and a receiver. He drags it over the ground, signal goes in. When it hits something, it bounces back up and it's detected by that. And right. what we actually get is a vertical slice of the ground, and we can see deeply into the ground, far more deeply than with the resistance. Yeah. Um, and have you had any joy? Well, we think so. Oh, look at that. Now, it's difficult to interpret these. They've not had a lot of time to do the work. This is a vertical section of the ground. We're getting these very strong reflections here, and that's where we're going over the path. So that's just the path? Just yeah. the path, yeah. and there's an electric cable below it. Yeah. What's of interest? is this arc here, which suggests there may be a large stone or boulder. How but deep is that? Because well, is, is that two metres scale? These are approximate depths. So that's two metres down. Which is... So we'd I have mean, to the... start soon, wouldn't we? I just wanted you to know <laughs> that it was two metres down, right? Time to talk to Ray. How fond of this garden are you? Yes. <laughs> no, I want a pond here. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, well yeah. this is your lucky day. <laughs> oh, that's all right. How then. about a well? <laughs> uh, would you be OK if we dug something down to at least two metres? Yeah. I suppose so. I mean, it could it, it be a bit more to the surface. of your building over there, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah. That, and it would yeah. be useful to find that out. The truth is that we can't wait for more radar information because we then wouldn't have enough time left to dig, and excavating is the only sure way to find out what's down there. It could be part of another Roman building, or just an isolated bit of stone. Hopefully, we'll find out tomorrow. Join us after the break. Day two, and the hole in the lawn is getting seriously big. Caroline and Jenny have already shifted loads of earth. Can I get in your trench? Of course. And 
as you can see, this is uh, about a metre down. There's still another metre left to go. There's even talk of getting a bigger JCB in, although how they're going to get it into the garden, I've absolutely no idea. And all this because our brand new, untried, untested Swedish technology says there might be something down here. Keep your fingers crossed for us. I think you should install a lift in here, Jen. Last night, the Roman coin Ray found in this area of the garden went to be x-rayed, but it hasn't produced the results we'd hoped for. But I must admit, looking at the x-ray at the moment, there isn't anything particularly obvious on the coin. However, amazingly, Guy, our coin expert, still thinks he might be able to identify it. And this is the coin that you found under the stone? Yeah. This one here, is it? Mm -hmm. OK, so the best thing for me to do is to hold it up to the light. And I can tell from the shape of the head that it's the Emperor Trajan, which dates it to between the years 98 and 117 AD. <laughs> How can you tell that? It's the shape of her head, Tony, because Trajan has a very distinctive uh, Roman haircut. Can you imagine the hair sort of cut down, a little bit like uh, an early beetle? Yeah. But he doesn't have a beard. You see the chin on there? Can you see the chin just above my little finger? Oh, uh, yes. Every other second century emperor, like Hadrian, Antoninus, Pius and Marcus Aurelius, they all have beards. Oh, very good. But this is not a first century portrait. All those faces tend to be longer and thinner. But Trajan's got a very distinctive face. So, Mr Holmes, tell us the dates again. 98 to 117 AD. But the trouble is, though, Tony, it's not quite as helpful as we might have thought. The coin is very worn. And coins like this could have circulated for anything up to 150 years after they were struck. A little bit like finding a Victorian penny in your pocket when you were a child. The sort of thing we all used to do. And it's very important to bear that in mind with coin evidence. What would be the value of that in the Roman times? Well, at the time we're talking about, a Roman soldier was paid 300 silver coins a year. Now, each silver coin was worth four of these. So a Roman soldier would receive 1,200 of these a year half yeah. of which roughly would be deducted for his food and supplies. Yeah. So he'd end up with about 600 in his pocket. So mm -hmm. imagine getting a couple of these every day, roughly, in your right. pocket. Probably felt like having a £10 note. Yeah, OK. But it's very, very difficult to make an exact comparison. Oh, very good. That's what I've, I've wondered that on, you know, what yeah. these things were worth. Well, just see if you can get a round for a tenner down at the pub tonight. <laughs> And when we place Ray's corroded coin against one in much better condition, we can see more clearly what Guy was describing. And this coin does help a bit in that we now know the Roman building fills digging can't be any earlier than 98 AD. Beyond that, our only other clues so far are the bits of Samian pottery found here, which indicate that we could be dealing with a building belonging to the early part of the second century AD. We still think the building was part of the Vicus, the settlement around the fort. And Lindsay and Victor are currently speculating on what it might have looked like. The people who lived in the, in the Vicky um, were the people who Sup would have to support themselves in some way. So most of yeah. them were selling things or making things. Um, so most of them, the first room would be where they did the selling. Yeah. Um, the second room would probably be where they did the, the making and the, and the storing, well, and then they back. lived at the back. Yeah. So they didn't live above the shop, they lived behind the shop. Quite long, are they? Very well, long, skinny cause... buildings, yes. I mean, they're called strip houses, um, literally because they do run from front to back in quite a long way. And it's the narrow street frontage because everybody wanted to be on the main street, so you have these very narrow strip houses, as we're doing see. in medieval yeah, burgages yeah. as well, the same sort of principle. If the building remains where digging are strip houses, then there should have been Roman roads nearby. Ray has an idea that this lane next to his garden and this road leading to the river could be ancient roads that ran through the Vicus. Stuart is currently working here. What does he think of this theory? From the work I've been doing, I, I support that theory entirely. I've been trying to fit the context of the building in your garden to yep. the wider Roman settlement and yep. fort here. And what I've discovered is that the, the fort uh, has a, a south gate yep. up on top of the hill. Yep. And from that south gate, this would be the line of a road down from it. We head off and Stuart has also been able to identify different phases of building up at the fort. What I think we've got is a, a first fort established, an early fort established up on top of the hill. Yep. And then at some later stage, the fort is made smaller and an, another fort is placed over the top of it. We've got that both from earthworks and excavation evidence. Yeah. Then we have a series of roads, one coming in from Old Carlisle, yeah. one coming in from uh, Maryport to the west. And around this fort would grow a civilian settlement. So we know that there's a road coming out the south gate down here. 
the little cobble way that's between your two buildings it could be like a back alley or a little roadway, right. part of a network of, of small buildings and, and structures. In the room next door, the clay stamps are now dry enough to be used on the mould, which, if all goes well, we'll be using tomorrow to make a figured Samian ware bowl. Once it's stamped, Gilbert's plan is to try and pre-dry the mould in the Buckingham's oven before it goes into the kiln tonight. We are finding some nice bits of figured Samian ware pottery in Trench 1. Some finds, however, are more difficult to recognise. What you got there, then? Oh, that's rather nice, isn't it? And it's just lying on straight on the top of that clay, isn't it? Oh, look at that. Well, hopefully one of our fine specialists will be able to tell us. It's bronze, because that's the colour bronze goes in the ground. Now, let's just see, where's the imprint it came out from? It's like a half circle. It's come from a half circle, yes. We've got nothing coming up the side, and the most obvious thing that that might be is perhaps a section of a Roman mirror, which we'll have to have it conserved properly to find out whether it... What they would put is a kind of silvering or tinning on the surface of the bronze to get that reflective surface. They didn't have mirrors in the way that we have them. We had to use metal mirrors. But a standard Roman shape for a mirror is a, is a flat circle of bronze. And it wouldn't have been anything like as good as a mirror we would have had nowadays, but it would have been very effective on a day-to-day -day basis, and likely to belong to a woman. And that's I was going to say, yeah. yeah. We're, out, we're out in that settlement where we think some of the soldiers might have had their wives, legitimate or otherwise, out here living, <laughs> and maybe families as well, children right. and everything else down here. Right, Phil, we need to have a very, very careful look in the ground around this piece of bronze and see whether we can find anything else, any other pieces of it, or perhaps a part of the handle yeah. if it's still there, OK? Phil's first concern, however, is to make a decision on how we proceed safely with Trench 2. Wow. About a metre twenty. Yeah. So the machine can't go much deeper, so we'll have to I'm decide what to do I don't like modern backfill being just left up in a near vertical section. We've got to make this hole bigger, we've got to make it wider, we've got to make bigger box so that if anybody works down there is safe. Geophys have only estimated that the archaeology is two metres deep under the lawn. It could be deeper. And as if we haven't got enough to do here, Geophys have now produced more exciting results from this field closer to the river. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's been going on? Well, we've been looking at the earthworks in here and we've now got the geophysics results. We think we're in the Vicus, this settlement next to the fort. And so if we sort this out, it'll help to place Ray and Helen's house as to what's going on in this lower part of the site. That geophys looks good. It's yeah. cracking colours, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's only because the black ran out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. Well, what can we see there? Well, I've got some high resistance features which are in, in blue. You can see that they cover an actual large area. We think these are walls of buildings, mm. you see, and we're just debating whether to put a trench somewhere through here just to test if it's Roman or not. Mm. How do these tie in with what you've seen, Stuart? Well, we've been uh, looking at the, the, the relationship of the fort and, and Ray's house and trying to work out if there's any alignments. And we've identified where the south gate of the fort might be and the line of the, the, the road coming down from it, which is this lane down here. And we know from finds, there's Roman finds that side of the road, so we need to know if anything comes this side. And a little earthworks in here, which uh, geophysics are now showing there's something underneath us. And also we've got antiquarian references from Stukeley in the 18th century, which describes walls and flag floors and so on in Sibby's Brow. And we know from the tithe map that this is Sibby's Brow. So we may have something under here. The thing that strikes me is what a fantastic view yeah. this is. I mean, if you build something here, you're looking yeah. out on that with the mountains beyond. And you've <coughs> got this big road over here. Yeah. And the river, of course, may not have been in this course. It may have come round this big sweep below us. So it's a, it's a cracking sight. It's a, it would be a prime sight yeah. in Roman times, yeah. wouldn't it? Thankfully, unlike Ray's garden, the archaeology here should be much nearer the surface and much easier for the residents of Papcastle to watch what we're doing and test my knowledge of geophysics. Does the geophysics actually work on how the um, stone is actually compacted in the ground or is it to do with the actual types of materials of the stone? Um, or the soil or things. John! <laughs> <laughs> it's only when you get up here that you realise how close to Scotland we are. 
Yeah, because that's the Solway Firth over there, and beyond that was outside the Roman Empire. That was that was where the Picts were. Whereas on this side, you know, it's the military zone. And is the, that a Roman road? Yeah, this is the this is the Roman road coming from Carlisle, the really big Roman centre just behind Hadrian's Wall, heading back towards our fort at Papcastle. From the helicopter, you also get a better sense of the size of Papcastle. So here we are, look, okay. uh, here's the cliff where the river may have been below us, and then the earthwork across the front here, which may have been the, the edge of the Vicus, and then we are trenching behind it. And where's Ray and Helen's house? Just a couple of hundred metres away, look. If you look down through that gap in the building... I see it. You see the little mini digger with the yellow yeah. arm on it? So it's pretty close, isn't it? It is, and we know that there is stuff underneath us here, so the stuff between the two. There's our bigger hole, and then if we can stop, Jeff, somewhere here, we're looking right down now, looking to our trench. There's Phil, look, digging. And down on the ground, it looks like our Swedish radar machine has been proved a success, because we found more foundation stones in trench two. Up here, look. Mick? Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh. That's what the radar anomaly was, yeah. was it? Quite nice, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I think Sue and Jasper are quite pleased with it, to say the least. A find? Hey! Oh, I was going to ask you if you've got any finds oh. from it. <laughs> yeah. That's the first one? First one. First. So uh, it hasn't been so chock-a-block with Roman pottery? No, nothing at all. I was just breathing in to say, do we know this is Roman? But yeah. presumably a, it's a, a first <laughs> clue, anyway. Samian wear, with a figure on it, isn't it? That's what it oh, is. Oh, it's the, it's the figured Samian, isn't it? Yeah. That's what they're making up at the incident room. It looks like all the soil above has been dumped here at a later date and that we're only just now coming down onto the actual Roman levels. But what geophysics have given us, we think, is more evidence for a second Roman building. Because these stones not only look like the ones Ray found, but they're at the same level and seem to be on a similar alignment. However, Phil is digging here at the moment and is up to his neck in sticky clay and cobbles, which could be part of something entirely different. How are you getting on? Oh, what? He's digging a well. He's so wet, you won't uh, believe it. Oh, dear. Oh, Had you planned on a water feature? That could be arranged. <laughs> <laughs> it could be arranged. What on earth have you got there then, Phil? Well, it's this enormous great ditch, Mick. And it is just full up with cobbles. And the thing of it is that if we've got all this archaeology here, and that is archaeology, yeah. this thing is cut through it. In other words, it's later than all that. And it's going that there's way. A hell of a, there's a hell of a lot of archaeology here. Yeah. So it's going that way, this ditch. This, this, this ditch is running this way. And you can see how steep the sides are. And I assume it's going to be, it's got to be a flat bottomed one, isn't it? So it's outside this building that Tony it's and I are definitely stood on. Outside, the, outside the building. So this looks like evidence of later activity here during the Roman period, which is only really what we should expect, because we know from the range of finds that the Romans were here for over 300 years. Really? We've got some, of, um, some bits of pottery which are coming from the 4th century, oh. and that's nice pottery. For example, here we've got a piece of painted Cranbeck ware mortarium. So it's the oh, same basic idea of mortarium. But we haven't but had a decorated We haven't had decorated it. It's not that common. Meanwhile, out in Sibby's field, the news is that we've found more Roman archaeology, as predicted by geophysics. But before I've even had a chance to have a look, Mick's organising another trench in this field. What's happened, Tony, is we've put the trench across that anomaly. Yeah. We've got a wall on both sides with what appears to be a road surface going through the middle. Yes. We've now expanded the geophysics. And if I just show you on a sketch, there's the trench going across the two walls and the road. Yes. We've now got this anomaly going under the bank and doing a right angle turn there, mm. possibly returning there. In other words, these aren't walls or buildings that we thought. They're more likely to be streets or yeah. lanes. Yes. I don't understand. I thought a vicus was a higgledy-piggledy. Well, that's exactly. the whole that's point. That's why it's so it interesting. It looks regular. 
Understandably, Mick and John are getting quite excited because this could mean that Roman Pap Castle was a much bigger and more important place than had been previously thought. So as we approach the end of day two, you could say that we're all feeling we're doing rather well. In fact, it seems to be getting more exciting by the minute. And what we've got here, look, is this burning and ash and these stones looks like a half. It does, doesn't so it? So presumably we're, we're, we've got the fire in the middle of this room. So just one more important job to do today, and that's to take a trip to a local factory where we're going to put our pottery mould into the kiln to fire overnight. Oh, I haven't seen this since the decoration's been. It's beautiful, isn't it? Savour it before it goes in the kiln, because there's presumably a chance it's going to break up in the firing. Well, it's been dried rather quickly during the day, and hopefully we've got all the moisture out. Uh, but otherwise, it uh, it could crack up. But uh, no, I think it's going to be okay. Right, really, well, because, let's get it yeah, in. I'll keep yeah. my fingers crossed. Day three and a quiet Sunday morning in Pap Castle. Until we start work, that is. But there's lots to do today, as Ray is explaining to his neighbour, because we now think we have evidence of at least two Roman buildings in this garden. We also have a rather large cobble-filled trench, which we hope to get to the bottom of today. Phil! Ah, oh, Tony! We've got right. reinforcements. Oh, what? God, ah, strength in numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had any more thoughts on what these cobbles might be? Most definitely, yeah. I think I've stood in an enormous foundation trench. What makes you think that? Well, because this, the sheer scale of it, and look, this material here, all this clay on both sides, it's not going to be very, very substantial to build on. So what they've done is they've dug an enormous trench right the way through, and then down at the bottom here, you get onto something that is really, really firm, that's the sort of thing that you'll be prepared to rest your foundations on. Do you think this is plausible, Tony? Yes, I think you've got substantial clay and cobble foundations to a very, very substantial building indeed, a monumental building. It puts, uh, it puts the Vicus at Pap Castle onto, onto, onto another plane, really, if you've got a monumental building of the sort that could sit on a, on a huge foundation of that sort of depth and and solidness. So this it's, is quite a significant trench? Oh, yeah. This what does it imply might have been on top of it? Uh, 1984, Adrian Olivier dug a, a site a little further away in the village, um, and he got a clay platform with really big stone foundations from the third century, and he was interpreting a temple on top of that. You can have more than one temple in the settlement, of course, or you can have um, a basilican building or something What's like that. that. Big, a big hall, basically, a market say, could, hall. Could it be a public building? I think it's got to be with, with, with founds, right. the foundations of that size. And, I mean, could, presumably it could have been either timber or stone on top of this. Well, on top of this building, you would certainly have had a, a massive stone foundation. Mm. I would have thought you wouldn't mm. have bothered with... If you could afford to do this, you wouldn't yeah. have worried about timber. Timber. You, no, oh, I don't think so. Yeah. You would have gone and quarried some very substantial masonry. Well, the Buckinghams are going to be pleased. They now have a third Roman building in their garden, but this one's much bigger and more important. The question is, what do we do next? I think we've got to sort out the relationship between this big trench with the boulders and this building that Ray discovered, because you're saying that it's not clear which no, comes before it... which here, and we're only going to sort that out by looking in this area down here. One of the really nice finds that came out of this trench was the fragment of Roman mirror. And I'm pleased to report that we now have a conservator cleaning it up. It doesn't look very much like a mirror at the moment, does it? No, the soil's very soft. It should come off quite easily. Is that the front or the back you're doing, then? Um, this is the front. So it would have been the reflective side? Yeah. Yes, we're hoping that um, we'll be able to find silvering or tinning, which will be the reflective surface. And if we're really lucky, just where Karen is um, scalping away there now, there may well be decoration. Sometimes you get Actually, on the silvered surface? On the silvered surface, a little pattern around the outside. Right. The mirror was found just here in trench one. And Ray's hoping that we might turn up something just as nice in trench two. Right. I think at the moment it's looking like this, this area is outside. Right. And behind you's the inside. Well, that would tie up with 
what we believe we've got from our earlier work. Yeah. But uh, at the moment, I'm just coming down onto all this this rubbish. And what's this? Is this sort of a fl the floor surface or just I de don't, demolition rubbish? I think it's demolition or rubbish building up against the wall. It's not really coherent enough to be a floor. <laughs> Hello. Let's have a look at this. Hi, then. Do you remember yesterday we took a picture of you lot standing outside your house? Yes. Now you all are on telly now. What Victor has done is magically put clothes on you that you would have been wearing if you'd been Roman children, Roman family. Do you want to see what it looks like? Yeah. Oh, look, look at, at that. that. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, look Tom, at Daddy. Tom, he's got no shoes on. He's got no shoes on. He's got no shoes on. Well, it's supposed to be Daddy's something. got them buckles on and Mummy's got... It's clunkers. Yeah, she's got boots on. Yeah. Yeah. And can you see what you're holding? Yeah. I'm oh. holding a ball. You're holding a ball? And that ball would have been made of leather and it would have been stuffed with chicken feathers, so it bounced. And, and that doll that. would have been made of wood. And you like your dress, Thomas? No. Your little tunic. No. <laughs> <laughs> Out in Sibby's field, Geophys are working quickly to expand their survey in the hope that we'll get a better understanding of the Roman archaeology we've discovered here. The idea developed that we thought we might be dealing with either streets or lanes or buildings. There we are. Now, you, you oh, haven't grief. seen this, Tony, have you? It's this no, way no, around. No, no. And that's, that's the bit there. And we, we, what we're doing is we're digging across here and across here. Yeah. And you see, this is very rectilinear with, yeah. with, with this. And if we, if we can show that it's either like this or not like this over the whole of this area, then the implications, it seems to me, are enormous. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay was saying, why can't it be a sort of core bridge type situation? Mm. This is a town at the back of the wall that was servicing the troops at the front, and that had quite a rectilinear plan, I gather. Yes, it does. It does, and, and, and you know, grand buildings planned into the centre of it. Which at, we're at, also at getting phases. now. It opens up the question, you know, where does Vika stop and town start? In and what's the difference between the two, well, presumably? Yeah, I mean, in the south of England, Forts get Viki around them, the troops move north, and the Viki turn into yeah. regular functioning cities many, like Sarum, Sester, Gloucester. That's right, many places which are like still that. there, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, in the north, you don't get that later phase. You, you, you've got right. Um, right. a fort which is there, the, the garrison's there all the time throughout the Roman period. In addition to the cobbled surfaces and wall lines we're uncovering in this field, we're beginning to get some interesting small finds. Oh, it's a bronze dumbbell button. So this is quite a small one, so it might be for clothing, but I think it's more likely to be harness. Oh, um, is it a thread goes round there, right. basically, yeah. um, to use like a toggle on a, on a duffel coat. Right, yeah. Second century, third century, they go on being used for a long time. It's a very efficient way of attaching things. We're also making new discoveries while cleaning the Roman mirror. I've been going through the mud and I found oh, a yeah. small fragment and this does have some decoration on. Oh, terrific. And you can just see it. It's not... Just a little stamp, um, circular stamp. Yeah, that's terrific. Because that does prove it's Roman. That's, that's wonderful. It, it's not a big Iron Age hand mirror. It's, it's definitely a, a Roman circular mirror. Yeah. So it looks, um, Victor, as if we've got it right. Or rather, you've got it yeah. right. Your drawings are <laughs> actually splendid. So basically, we've got some decoration running just round the rim there. Not a lot, but just a little to give it that emphasis. In Trench 1, Phil's still busy in his cobble-filled ditch, while a few feet away, the hearth is becoming much easier to see. The best pieces of masonry from these Roman buildings would have been robbed away and reused elsewhere, but is there a chance we might find bits of the buildings still in the garden? Well, it's moulding, isn't it? Roman moulding. It is definitely Roman. I would think so, yeah. Oops. Does it move? Yeah, but it's incredibly heavy. Go on. Blimey. That's it. But it's a nice, crisp, crisply executed bit of work. This could be from the building that we've, that we've got down there. I mean, very easily, I would have thought. But what part there. of the That's building the is it? Can we work That's it out? Secondary... Is that a gutter? Yes. I think, well, I, well, unless somebody can come up with some exp other explanation. You, I... think you don't think it is? I'm not ever so certain. Um, I'm just thinking about cornices, you know, nice deep moulded cornice rather than something for water to run along. 
Given that we're, we're starting to build up a picture of a fort with a, a vicus round it, mm -hmm. I thought it'd be very useful to try and look at the, the types of vicai that we actually know about and what the layouts are. Because the more we look at your garden, the more we look at Sibber's brow, alignments are starting to appear. Right. Um, you go from examples like this at Oak Carlisle, where you get buildings developing along the roads around the fort. Oh, right. So you get regular layouts of buildings, but irregular patterns of roads. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. one type of vicus which is fairly common. You get examples like at Vindolanda where the vicus clusters very close in into the gateway yeah. of the fort and it's very very compacted around there. Yeah. To very large examples oh, right. which like this one at Brancaster there's the fort. Now yeah. that is a very very big regular planned layout yeah. and with the evidence that's emerging here at Pap Castle it looks to me as if we, we might be getting something like a very big vicus, perhaps with an overall planned layout, which makes it very, very important. Oh, very good. Are we any nearer agreement? Yes, I think we've got it now, and we've got it the right way up as well. Um, this is really well tooled. There's very, very close tool marks on it. It's very fine work. This is meant to be seen, whereas the underside is, is a lot rougher. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're looking at is the cornice from the roof, bottom of the top of the roof line, bottom of the roof, top of the wall, um, of a very good building again. That piece, Tony, is, is up there That's yeah. right. on, on the building. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it projects wall. out in the same way that that gutter does. And throws water off, uh, <coughs> throws the water off the wall, off yes. the face of the wall. So, it comes off this way. If it wasn't worn as, if this wasn't worn by using it as a step, you'd probably get some water wear, which shows, which would show how much of this actually protruded. It hasn't been. Yes, quite. <laughs> what is that? What is that? Yes. It's the same. Oh, that's, that's, that's it. There, right. That is actually the I line. Found it. I found it. <laughs> so that, that's how far it protruded that's out. That's how far it stuck out. Then. Yeah. Yeah. At the local factory, the moment has arrived when we have to take our Samian pottery mould out of the kiln. Right. Do you think it's going to be a one piece kiln? <laughs> but I'm really well, nervous I, I, about this. I very much hope so, yes. Let's have a look, see. It's, uh, yes, fingers crossed. It's Great. perfect. It's fine. It's fine. It's amazing. Yes. I can't believe it's actually fired. But no time to dwell on this success because the plan now is to use the mould to make a figured Samian ware bowl and have it ready to show the Buckinghams by the end of the day. There is a lot of tension. Is this the here. worst bit, really? Yes, it? yes. First of all, a balloon of clay, as Gilbert calls it, is inserted into the mould. It's important to make sure that the clay is pushed into the decoration on the sides of the mould. You realise this is the first time I've done this, don't you? <laughs> this is the first time you've done this? This method? Really? Yes. Now you tell us. <laughs> Gilbert is, in fact, one of the few people in the country with the expertise to try and make Samian ware. The trouble is, of course, that he's never had to do something like this in just three days. Just as Karen has never before had to clean a Roman mirror. Hi, Karen. How's it going? Really, this is just about finished. I've just been given the mirror, the final thing, <gasps> and that there's lots of silvering left on it. Good. It's in really Great. good condition. Look at that. That's absolutely amazing. I let you move hand up now. I actually see my hand and the ring glinting. That's really amazing. I wonder if I can see my face in it. Actually, I move my head up and down. You can, you can just about see it. I'm the first person to look into this mirror for 2,000 years. In Trench 2, the news is that Ian has found a piece of Roman pottery under one of the stones. But unfortunately, it's not a bit that helps us date the building. And now, as we approach the end of our weekend in Pap Castle, it's time for Phil's final thoughts on the complicated archaeology in Trench 1. So, Phil, did we manage to sort out the sequence between this big stone foundation and raised wall? Yes, Mick, we did. It, 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 is, it is, as we thought, these stones which form, form part of raised building yeah. are definitely cut away by this really big building. So that's definitely after that one. That is fact, definitely yeah. after that and one. And did you get any, have we got any dating material for any of that? Well, we know that right at the bottom, we are 
late first, early second century. Oh, right. and, yeah. and interestingly enough, we seem to have a big build up of material, which yeah. actually raising the level of the ground about then, and then a whole series of buildings on the top of that. Well, that's good, isn't it, Ray? Are you happy about that? I think, no, when you put it into context, you've tidied up the ideas that I had about this. I mean, it now makes sense. I mean, we've got better information from what I can gather from around the village, so it's, I think you've been very successful this weekend. The next time you want an extension, you'll get archaeologists to do the digging, don't it? Well, no, I mean, you should, you, <laughs> you should have been here two and a half years ago. What we can say for sure is that this garden is packed full of archaeology. Just from the pottery finds alone, we can tell the Buckinghams that there was Roman activity here for over 300 years. And the earliest bit is this piece of black burnished ware. Oh, right. And you can see on the screen there, yeah. it's a flat bottom dish with straight sides. And this right. is the sort of dish that the soldiers would be eating their dinners off in the second century. Although our trenches will now be backfilled and Ray plans to lay a patio around the extension, the Buckingham family will now know that just under their feet they have several phases of Roman occupation. Possibly two domestic buildings, seemingly on the same alignment, which we think could have been strip houses and might have looked something like this around the early part of the second century AD. And there are also traces of a later monumental Roman structure, a building on a similar scale to this, perhaps a public building, and part of a zone of large, impressive Roman buildings in Papcastle. It's worth mentioning that we're not very far away from Carlisle, and in the 6th century, we know from monastic writings and things that there was a working fountain and an arch. They were yeah. such substantial buildings, they were still in working order 200 years <laughs> after the end of the Roman period. Well, we think the Roman period is That's ending, right, fact, right yeah. up here in the very part of the country we're in at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the moment of truth, isn't it, Gil? But it don't worry, the, don't panic. It is the moment of truth. You sound very nervous. But the problem is whether it will actually come out of here. This is, this is, this is oh, what God. This is what we are... It's worked! God, that's amazing. That's beautiful. Look at it. All those, all those stamps you made, Victor. It's all come, come kill, but you're right. You need oxygen. <laughs> it's worked. And although we haven't got time to fire it in the kiln, Gilbert wants to make the footing for the bowl before we show it to the Buckinghams. Nick! Hi there! Time's up! I know! The villagers are amassing. <laughs> yeah. How far have we got with this? Well, it's still very complicated, like it was this morning, but we're getting some smashing finds out of here. Uh, where's that piece of salmon ware that was... There we are. Phil, this was in a proper context, wasn't it? Yeah, it came from a sealed context. Right, so that's, that's the sort of stuff we're getting. Good Lord. Wow, look at that. Well... So what does that mean? What we've got here is something we call a Form 37 bowl, very similar to the one that Gilbert's making up in the incident room. And I can date it from the decoration to around the year 75 to 95 AD, firmly within the first century. And we're getting stuff like this as well, look, which is Roman brick, isn't it, Guy? That's a very so large know. piece of Roman brick. It's so thick, it almost certainly comes from a very substantial piece, yeah. maybe used for flooring, maybe part of, yeah. the, of the walls here. And then the other trench over there, we've got a Roman wall, we've got a piece of nice amphora from it. So, you know, it's all coming together. And what does it mean? Well, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, subject to what the geophysics shows us, we think we're in a, you know, a domestic area, don't yeah, we? Yeah, but it's Probably. more than the beakers we've been dealing with. It's beginning to look much more like a full-sized town. This is much more important than just a John. straggling here we are. <laughs> John, 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 John. Of time. You're going to have to get the incident room closer to the field. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the same pattern going on, have we? Look, more results. Um, this is where the one trench is, this is the other trench, yeah. and this is the, the bank, yeah. the later bank. But the street system continuing across the whole field, more roads going off at right angles, um, buildings outside and buildings alongside the street, possibly something on a different alignment here. So there's certainly quite a lot of phases. So we're still thinking of the idea of a vicus, a civil settlement, are we? It just, there's nothing to alter our basic idea from this morning. No real change. Right, it's just that. a bigger area of Just a, a bigger area. So it's substantial, it's planned, it's more than one phase. And it's much more important probably than just an ordinary vicus. It's got much grander buildings in, which is, you know, a substantial <laughs> advance in what we knew three days ago. So, uh, are you ready to tell the, uh, the local people what we think it all is? Yeah, I think so, especially <laughs> we've got big things like this to charm as well. I'm ready to go. And it looks like most of the village has turned out to see how we've got on. 
And what we can now tell them is that the reason so many of them have Roman finds in their gardens is because the Vicus here at Pap Castle occupied a much bigger area than was previously thought and could have looked like this. One theory suggested is that Pap Castle could have been an important staging post on the frontier in the early period of occupation and then developed into a Roman town and administration centre for all the forts on the coast, just as Corbridge is thought to have serviced the forts on Hadrian's Wall. It's not! It could have honestly wrong at any one of about ten stages. There it is. And look, you can see, that's the piece from Ray's garden. And that, it's exactly there. See the, the bush and the birds sitting in it. We've only just realised the birds actually facing the other direction. <laughs> but Gilbert did a wonderful job. It's absolutely amazing. It's going to have to be fired before yeah. it's really finished, yeah. but we haven't got time to do that. So this style of pot would date from where? About 75 to 100 AD, you know, the very end of the first century. Who knows, over the next few years, maybe an archaeologist will actually pull one as pristine as this out from somewhere around here. I wouldn't bank on it. <laughs> <laughs>